Hello folks and welcome back to English 306, the rhetoric of pop culture with me, Dr. Matt Barton. And in this lecture, we will be diving once again into the wonderful world of Scott McCloud and his amazing book, Understanding Comics. And I have to say, you know, I've read this book probably well over a dozen times and it doesn't seem to matter how many times I read the thing, it just utterly blows my mind. <laughs> It's just, it's just a truly fascinating uh, concepts and philosophies that McLeod talks about in this book, and, and I hope you're enjoying it. And if you're not, you know, I suggest go back and, and read it again. Take some time with it. You know, give it a little, uh, give it a chance because I think it will really grow on you, and you'll will, uh, you know, you'll see why it's considered such a classic. Uh, anyway, to get the ball rolling, I have a picture here of a famous uh, cartoon character named Homer Simpson, but it's not the typical picture. <laughs> uh, so for this question, you know, don't, don't spend a lot of time on this. I just want you to tell me, describe how this, Im this image of Homer Simpson makes you feel. Okay, so in this lecture, we will start by talking about what McLeod means by some of his vocabulary. Remember, part of this book is coming up with a vocabulary, a terminology, a jargon for comics. And so he'll talk about icons, abstraction, and identification. And then we'll compare uh, some of what McLeod says in this chapter to what Kenneth Burke had to say in the Dramatism chapter of Cell Now. And we'll also talk a little bit about John Berger's uh, documentary series for the BBC, a very classic series called Ways of Seeing. Uh, so I'll Put that at the end of the lecture. Something fun to uh, look forward to. Okay, so icons. Um, you might remember we talked about icons in Cell Now at the very beginning of the book. She talked about icons and uh, indexes and, and symbols. Uh, so some of that is uh, similar to what McLeod says, but also different. You know, they're, they're trying to talk about similar concepts. You know, there, there's going to be some uh, overlap, I guess, in the, in the terminology. Uh, but I think uh, the way McLeod breaks this up makes pretty good sense. So he just says an icon is any image used to represent a person, place, thing, or idea. Uh, so basically an image that represents something, I guess, besides itself, basically. Uh, and then he's got his uh, breakdown of icons. He's got three of them. Uh, the symbols, or symbolic icons, these are used to represent a concept, an idea, a philosophy, uh, so I think for that one, he uses the uh, peace sign, uh, or I guess a flag. You know, you could say a, a flag is kind of a, a, an icon, it's an image, but uh, it stands for um, an idea, I guess, of freedom or peace, or, you know, whatever the case may be. Now, that's the symbol, uh, symbolic side. Uh, then he has this category he calls the practical. I'm not sure I quite like that term, <laughs> uh, but this is, you know, the alphabet words on a page, uh, scientific symbols, uh, I guess math symbols, you know, just some, some kind of language or, or some kind of uh, images used to communicate uh, for practical ends. And then the last category here are pictures, which he just says are images that resemble their subject. So you can think about, you know, just a, a picture in a museum or you might call it a painting. You know, it's a, let's say it's a, uh, a portrait of somebody. So you'd say that would be a, an image that resembled the person that was posing for the, uh, the paint uh, pictures. Or, or I guess any kind of comic that looks like the things that it's representing. If, you, if you're reading a comic and there's a drawing there of the Eiffel Tower, for example, uh, you would say that is a picture. Uh, all right, levels of abstraction. This is where it starts to get interesting for me. Uh, so he says that some icons and uh, again, like the word I, which I guess would be a practical symbol in the, his uh, scheme, says these are very abstract. They don't look anything like the real thing. You don't, <laughs> like the word I here, E-Y-E, -E, uh, doesn't really look anything like an actual uh, eye, <laughs> an eyeball. <laughs> so you'd say that's pretty abstract. This is about as abstract as you can get is a word you know, is, is writing, I suppose, just E-Y-E, -E. or I guess maybe the sound I. Um, pretty abstract, doesn't really have a whole lot to do with the actual thing. Uh, whereas in comics and drawing, it's kind of on a continuum. 
You can have cartoons where the eye is just a little dot, <laughs> kind of very abstract, very um, doesn't look really much like anything other than a dot. Now all the way over to um, you know very photorealistic, looks almost like a photograph, a black and white photograph of an eye, and you'd say that would be uh, not so abstract. That's more realistic. Uh, so if you look here at, at this um, screenshot or screen grab here of the book. You can see on the left, to me, this drawing of a man, it looks almost like a photograph. It's, it's, it's very realistic. It's very detailed. They even have like the, the shadow of the, you know, the lighting effects. I mean, it looks just like what you see when you see an actual person's face. Uh, and then he does something kind of cool. He, he's sort of making steps towards more and more abstract versions of that drawing, I suppose, until we get to the very end. And it's just, the, you know, the classic... Uh, cartoon face, you know, the stick man face, uh, whatever you want to call this. Uh, so this is a, you know, fairly uh, clear what he's talking about there, right? You have a realistic drawings all the way uh, to abstract drawings and then beyond that to just the word like face. Uh, amplification through simplification. And so for McLeod, it's not just that, well, this little cartoon face here on the far right is, is poor or it's not a good drawing. Uh, or it doesn't convey meaning. Uh, he's not saying anything like that. Uh, he's got a, a pretty interesting thesis here. So he says an abstract drawing, abstract drawings strip down an image to its essential meaning and allow us to amplify that meaning in ways you can't with a more realistic one. Abstract images are more universal. They allow us to see the world within, within ourselves, Whereas realistic images show us the world without. <laughs> so, uh, again, this is where it really starts to get kind of mind blowing to me. Uh, so you have a uh, when you when you have this cartoon drawing of the face, you know you really see just sort of the parts of a face that I guess are most critical. You know the eyes and the mouth and the roundness of, of the head. Um, and you, you know the simple it's so simple you're really dive in and, and you notice those details in particular, you're not distracted by what you might consider less necessary or less, uh, you know, sort of a decorative items. I'm not sure how to put this, but, <laughs> you know, this one on the left here, you put some, some hair on it and it, you know, it gets a little bit less uh, abstract, a little more realistic, but also more limited. You know, at this point, and of course, as you go further and further to the left, it begins to look, you know, this one, I guess, could be man, woman, Pete, Jill, you know, any, it could be anybody. Um, even a bug, you know, caterpillar head. <laughs> uh, but as you go to the left, it looks more and more like a specific person. You think you might look at this one and say, well, yes, I, I probably, you probably know somebody that looks like this one. Probably know several people. Uh, and then as you get further along, though, you start thinking, hmm, maybe I know one person that looks like that. And then, of course, all the way over, and then you're like, okay, I don't know anybody who looks at least not exactly like that. Right? They get rarer and rarer, less and less universal, and more and more specific, uh, more and more unique, uh, basically. Uh, so that's, that's a couple, there's a couple of points in here that uh, are fascinating, right? And if you think about the, we talk about this in my 332 class, which is business, business writing, basically. And uh, it comes up in graphic design and any kind of a communication class where you're talking about uh, instructions, technical material. And the idea is uh, a lot of times when you're trying to explain something, a diagram or a drawing works a lot better than a photograph precisely because of what McClown is talking about here. Uh, you can take away everything that's unnecessary, all the frivolous stuff, uh, anything that doesn't directly pertain to the process you're trying to explain. You just don't draw that. <laughs> you just don't include that uh, in the drawing. You keep it simplified uh, to make it easier uh, for somebody to, uh, you know, interpret the uh, the process, to follow the instructions. Uh, so what he's saying here is absolutely spot on. Uh, now here's where he starts to get into uh, identification, and we will talk about Burke here in a minute and compare what Burke says about it. Uh, but this is a pretty good point. I'm sure you've done this. You look at the, uh, see an electrical outlet or the grill of a car, and, you know, it looks like a face, right? I look at this, I think these are kind of the eyes, and there's the mouth, 
<laughs> looks like he's ready for you know to be something plugged in there. Or maybe he's like really scary. I don't know how you. Uh, <laughs> he's like, oh my goodness, <laughs> how did I get here? <laughs> I'm trapped in this um, electrical socket. You know, I don't know. Um, but what I'm doing here is what McLeod says we all do. Uh, we see just everywhere around us uh, faces, and, and you kind of pretend like there's uh, emotions and an identity to that face. I mean, it could kind of, <laughs> I can almost, the longer I look at this outlet, uh, the more I almost start to see like a whole cartoon forming around it, right? A, a little storyline. <laughs> uh, so McLeod says this is because we are a self centered race, right? Everything. Uh, we look around and we see we see ourselves and everything you're kind of reflecting uh, back at us even in places where really I'm, I'm sure whoever did this outlet it's not like they were saying oh we need to make this look like a face <laughs> you know, I very seriously doubt that uh, it's just that we see a face there because of what you know McLeod says we're self-centered uh, then he gets into kind of psychological territory and this is a pretty interesting point too so you never see your own face and, and I put here, of course, a photo, you know, we're on Zoom so much now, you see your own face on, on Zoom, sure. But, you know, even in those cases, it's not like you're seeing it the same way that you see other people's faces, right? And, and some for some people, like the Zoom, when they see that little video, you know, of their own face, it, it kind of throws them for a loop and they, and they, and they, have, they, they get distracted and they have to turn that off. Just because they're not used to, to seeing something like that, it's kind of <laughs> even disturbing. Makes you very self-conscious. <laughs> uh, but putting aside that sort of you know video, photo, whatever, you know most of the time when you're talking to somebody face to face, you just kind of imagine what your face looks like. You know, you're like, am I smiling? You know, I'm smiling. What does that look like? Uh, I don't have a mirror in front of me. You know, I just uh, I just have to kind of imagine, uh, almost like a little cartoon sketch going on in my imagination as to what my face looks like, where my eyebrows are. <laughs> you know, and I'm sure you uh, do the same sort of thing, right? You have these, these sort of uh, vague uh, cartoons, basically, uh, that help you communicate. This is the way you, you self-monitor your, your communication, your facial expressions, your gestures, you know, all this stuff. Um, and McLeod, yeah, he compares this to a cartoon, and then he references McLuhan, uh, obviously an influence on him. And he says that a lot of this is true also of driving. And when you're driving a car, it's not like you're, con you're uh, concentrating and you're fully aware of, you know, where your hands and your feet and, you know, everything are. Uh, matter of fact, if you think too much about that sort of thing, you can have an accident. <laughs> I always think about when you uh, are teaching a kid, uh, kid to drive, or if you remember learning how to drive a car, uh, at first, you're like really self-conscious. You're really, uh, you know, paying a lot of attention to like where your hands are on the wheel, where, where your feet are on the pedals and all this stuff. And it, it actually makes it hard to drive, right? You can't really drive like that. You only get better at driving when more, uh, you know, when you can develop, I guess, this mental mind picture more. And so you're just sort of concentrating on the uh, sensations, I guess, the feelings of, uh, you know, the feedback, physical feedback from the, the wheel and the, and the car acceleration, <laughs> you know, all that sort of stuff that you need to be able to operate the vehicle uh, and not just, you know, on, on a millions of other little details uh, that really don't pertain to driving. Uh, okay, how does this compare to the identification that Kenneth Burke talks about? Uh, you know, and I'd love to see some papers on this if you're looking for a topic. Uh, but, you know, Kenneth Burke, when he's talking about dramatism, he talks about this term, terministic screen. And he says that we all have these. It's just fog of symbols through which we see the world. That's the way Kenneth Burke talks about this. And McLeod says pretty much the same thing about cartoons. So in a way, um, when McLeod says a cartoon like this is a vacuum into which our identity and awareness are pulled. So you kind of, let's see what he says here, an empty shell that we inhabit which enables us to travel in another realm. We don't just observe the cartoon, we become the cartoon. <laughs> or any else that talks about with that car example, you know, you become the car. So if somebody, um, you know, hits your bumper, you say, oh, he hit me. You know, say, oh, he hit my car. Uh, I guess you might say that, but, <laughs> you know, you'd be perfectly understood if you said he hit me uh, in the intersection, right? Um, 
so I think these two concepts are very related. Uh, I think the difference, though, is Burke says this just happens all the time, not just when you're looking at a cartoon. Uh, you know, if you're just looking around the room, uh, you're seeing, you're being pulled into the this terministic realm, right? This, uh, uh, you're seeing through this terministic screen. There's no way not to <laughs> see through it. Uh, but maybe Mac what McLeod, if you wanted to put these two ideas together, uh, maybe what McLeod might say is the different comics are sort of different terministic screens, right? And to really understand that comic, you sort of have to let yourself be pulled into it, uh, just like it is a realm, you know, a place uh, that you're going into and you're assuming a, a role uh, in the comic. I mean, it's pretty interesting stuff. Okay, the picture plane then. Uh, he's sort of put again putting all these ideas together about realism, abstraction, practical uh, icons, uh, aka language. And he says you can sort of map comics onto a triangle. And each of the points or intersections, I guess, of this triangle will be different extremes. <laughs> uh, so at the very at the lower left corner, you have very realistic, very detailed cartoons or comics basically where it's indistinguishable from uh, just looking out a window uh, all the way up to the picture plane which are just abstract shapes like a circle square you know etc uh, and then in the lower right is where we get the language um, point and this would be you know the words so let, let's see face so just the word the letters f-a-c-e face is, is considered language uh, over to the left, we get reality, the actual face that you're looking at, <laughs> all the way up to this picture plane, which would be maybe that circle, maybe that sort of looks like a face to you. You know, who knows? Uh, but, but he has a good time mapping all of the different comics, and he puts them at different points of this triangle. <laughs> you know, I don't know how incredibly useful that little exercise is, but it sure is fun. You know, just while I'm looking at this, uh, one of the things that students always bring up is that there's a, and you notice in that Homer Simpson image, is that when a cartoon uh, looks a little too realistic, uh, there's something called the uncanny uncanny valley effect, and uh, this goes back to Sigmund Freud, uh, of all people. But uh, it, it's uh, it's this idea that, uh, and they they talk about it with robots too, androids, uh, but there's a film called there's a Final Fantasy movie. And I forget the exact name of the movie, uh, but people, uh, some people loved it, uh, but other people said it was really creepy. And what made it so creepy was that the graphics, the computer graphics, the computer graphic animation, I guess, CGI, uh, was so realistic that it kind of triggered that some kind of mental instinctual reflex that we have, uh, that we use to separate, or I guess uh, distinguish between um, fake things and real things are like real people and uh, you know man store mannequins or whatever uh, but this was so the was so realistic that it kind of toyed around with that so it kind of made your that little switch keep flipping back and forth you know I guess some parts look more realistic than others and so you kept making that identification mentally with oh this is a real person and then like a split second later oh no that's not a real person that's CGI <laughs> and so it's kind of like this disturbing thing where it goes back and forth uh, really quickly and uh, you know I guess they could use some kind of uh, magnetic imaging or whatever to detect this but <laughs> needless to say I don't think it was a, a big hit you know and, and normally they would want the uh, you know, the more successful animations have to walk a line I guess you don't want it to be that realistic uh, but you want enough detail in there to be you know, you know aesthetically pleasing uh, all right moving on then he talks about McLeod uh, talks about received versus perceived information, and this is really where I think is kind of his weakest, weakest part of the chapter for me. Uh, I just don't agree with this. You know, I've seen this many times. I'm kind of surprised that McLeod, uh, and he might have changed this in later versions. I don't know, uh, but he says that a picture is received information. Uh, the message is instantaneous and requires no training or work to interpret what they mean. So you just, you just, you know, you see the face. And you know it's a face. Nobody has to tell you it's a face. You have to go to school to learn that's a face. Um, it just sort of jumps right into your brain. Uh, whereas uh, he says writing is perceived information. So of course you know no baby comes out of the uh, um, <laughs> you know the womb <laughs> uh, able to read. Um, 
And that'd be pretty cool if, if that was the case. But no, yet to be taught, you know, taught how to read. Um, however, you know, a lot of people uh, don't like this. It's not just me. You know, other pe plenty of people have argued with McLeod. I mean, and even he says he, he likes to be argued with. <laughs> just trying to put some ideas out there and see what see if they stick or not. Uh, but yeah, I mean, anybody can think of uh, photos or pictures where, you know, you'd be like, what the hell is that? What am I looking at? <laughs> like these uh, sonograms, or yeah, sonograms, I think these are called. Again, coming back to the womb again. <laughs> you know, they put these, uh, they get these photos, or they're not really photographs. I don't know how it works, but um, th these images pop out, and I guess that's supposed to be a, a baby in there. I've looked at these. I'm like, it looks like a some kind of alien creature, maybe. <laughs> uh, I, you need training. You know, you need uh, to go to school to learn how to look at these sort of uh, scans and be able to tell what the heck that is. And you know, a lot of uh, images are like this. So, <laughs> you know, I don't want to belabor the point. I'm just saying. Uh, you know, McLeod, it's good food for thought. You know, some sometimes you uh, find some counterexamples, and I think McLeod would be totally cool with that. All right, so to wrap up here, um, I mentioned at the beginning this John Berger series, and he, he, there's a book called Ways of Seeing, but the, really the documentary is where it's at, in my opinion, because you can you can actually see what he's talking about, so just uh, read about it or look at photos. But anyway, this is considered a great classic, one of the great documentaries of all time, and so I definitely want you to take a look at it. It's about, uh, I think, I don't know how many episodes there are total. Uh, but each episode's about half an hour long, and I'm not going to expect you to watch the whole thing. Uh, but definitely watch the first ten minutes, and, you know, if you want to, and you and you enjoy it as much as I do, by all means, watch the whole series if you want. Uh, but I think you'll get the gist of it in the first ten minutes. Uh, so I just want you to watch this, and you can see here he does talk in there about pictures and icons even, a bunch of other topics. And I think that McClown was inspired somewhat by this uh, documentary series, but I, I want to I want to want to know what you think. Uh, what do you think about what Berger is saying, and uh, how do you compare that to what McLeod is saying about comics? All right, I think that will do it for this lecture. As always, I'm always uh, eager to hear from you if you have questions or comments. Always uh, love reading those. Try to re respond as quickly as possible. Uh, but we will stop it here, and I'll see you next time.